Sutra, translated by Tripitaka Master Kumara Yuva of Yao Qin. Commentary Yao Qin is the name of the reign period of Emperor Yao Xing. It is not the same period as that of Qin Shi Huang, called the Yin Qing, or that of Fu Qian, which is called Fu Qin. Before the time of Emperor Sa Yao Xing, and during the time of Fu Qian, a man named Qin Tian Jian said to Fu Qian, Now one of great wisdom should come to try not to aid our government. Fu Qian said, It is probably Kumara Yeova, for he is honored and respected in India for his wisdom. Kumara Yeva, Kumara Yeva's father, Kumara Yana, was the son of a prime minister. He should have succeeded his father, but instead he left his home and went everywhere looking for a teacher. Although he hadn't left the home life in the formal sense by taking the complete precepts, he still cultivated the way and in his travels went to the country of Kutra in Central Asia. The king of Kutra had a little sister, and when she saw Kumarayana, she said to the king, I really love this man. The king gave his sister, his sister in marriage to Kumarayana, and she soon became pregnant. When Kumarayuva was still in his mother's womb, it was much like the situation with Shariputra and his mother. Kumarayuva's mother could defeat everyone in debate. At that time, an Ahad said, The child in this woman's womb is certainly one of the great wisdom. When Kumarayuva was seven years old, his mother took him to a temple to worship the Buddha. Kumarayuva picked up a large bronze incense urn and effortlessly lifted it over his head. Then he thought, hey, I'm just a child. How can I lift this heavy urn? With this one thought, the urn crashed to the ground. From this, he realized the meaning of the doctrine. Everything is made from the mind alone. And he and his mother left the home life. Kumara Yuva's mother had difficulty living the home life. Although Kumara Yuva's father had previously cultivated the way, he was now too much in love with his wife to permit her to leave home. Thereupon, she went to a strict fast. Unless you allow me to leave home, she said, I won't eat or drink. I'd starve myself. Then don't eat or drink if that's what you want, said her husband, but I'd never let you leave home. For six days, she didn't eat or drink, not even fruit juice, and she became extremely weak. Finally, Kumarayana said, this is too dangerous. You're going to starve to death. You may leave home, but please eat something. First, call a drama master to cut off my hair. She said, and then I'll eat. A Dharma master came and shaved her head, and then she ate. Shortly after leaving home, she certified to the first fruit of Ahatri. Soon after that, Kumara Yiva, her son, also left the home life. Every day, he read and recited many sutras, and once he read them, he never forgot them. He was not like some of you who have recited the Sura Gama Mantra for several months but still need the book. Because of his phoneless memory, he defeated all non-Buddhist philosophers in India and became very well known. His reputation spread to China and when Fu Qian heard of him, he sent the great general Lu Huang and 70,000 troops to Kutra to capture Kumarayuva and bring him back to China. Kumarayuva said to the king of Kutra, China is sending troops, but do not oppose them. They don't wish to take 
the country they have another purpose, and you should grant them their request. The king's uncle wouldn't listen to Kumar Ravjiva, and he went to war with the general from China, Lu Kuang. As a result, the king of Kutra was put to death. The country defeated, and Kumar Ravjiva captured. On the way back to China, General Lu Kuang. One day, prepared、uh, to camp in a low valley, Kumara Yuva, who had spiritual powers, knew a rain was coming, which would flood the valley. He told the general, "Don't camp here tonight. This place is dangerous." But Lu Kuang had no faith in Kumara Yuva. "You are a monk," he said. "What do you know about military affairs?" That night, there was. A deluge, and many men and horses were drowned. General Lu Kuang then knew that Kumara Jiva was truly inconceivable. They proceeded until they heard that there had been a change in the Chinese government. Emperor Fu Qian had been deposed, and Yao Chang had seized the throne. General Wu Kuang maintained his neutrality and did not return to China. Yao Chang was emperor for several years, and when he died, his nephew Yao Xing took the throne. It was Yao Xing who dispatched a party to invite Kumara Yuva to China to translate sutras. A gathering of over eight hundred bishops assembled to assist him in this work. We have proof that Kumara Jiva's translations are extremely accurate. When he was about to complete the studies that he that is die, he said, "I have translated numerous sutras during my lifetime, and I personally don't know if my translations are correct. If they are, when I am." Cremated, my tongue will not burn. But if there are mistakes, it will. When he died, his body was burned, but his tongue remained intact. The Tang Dynasty Vinaya Master Tao Xuan once asked the God Lu Xuan Chang, "Why did everyone prefer to read and study Kumara Jiva's translations?" The God replied. Kumara Jiva has been the translation master for the past seven Buddhas, and so his translations are accurate. The Tripitaka is the collection of Buddhist scriptures. It is divided into three parts: sutras, which deal with samadhi; sastras, which deal with wisdom; and the Vinaya, which is the study of moral precepts. A Jama master. Takes the drama as his master and gives the drama to others. Some drama masters chant sutras. Some maintain them in their minds and practice them with their bodies. Some write them out and some explain them to others. The drama master spoken of here is Kumara Jiva. This Sanskrit name means youth of long life. One could say young Kumara Jiva. Will certainly live、uh, to a great age. One could also say he is young in years but mature in wisdom, eloquence, and virtue. He has the wisdom of of an old old man, and so he is called youth of long life. It was Kumara Jiva, the youth. With the virtuous conduct of an elder who translated the Buddha speaks of Amitabha Sutra from Sanskrit into Chinese, all sutras may be divided into three parts: the preface, the principal proper, and the transmission. The preface discusses the sutra's general meaning. The principal proper discusses its doctrines. And the transmission instructs us to transmit the sutra, to propagate it and make it flow like water everywhere. The preface is like the, a person's head, and the principle proper is like his body. Just as our organs are very clearly arranged within our bodies, 
so are the doctrines clearly set forth within the sutras. The preface may also be called the afterword. Isn't that a contradiction, you ask? It is not a contradiction because it wasn't spoken by Shakyamuni Buddha himself, but was added later when Ananda and Mahakasyapa edited the sutras. It may also be called the arising of Dharma preface because it has forth the reasons the sutra was spoken. It is also called the certification of faith preface because it proves that the sutra can be believed. In the preface, six requirements are fulfilled. They are faith, hearer, time, host, place, and audience. Sutra, thus I have heard. At one time, the Buddha dwelt at Sravati in the Jetta Grove in the garden of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary together with a gathering of great bishops, 1250 in all, all great ahas whom the assembly knew and recognized. Commentary thus fulfills the requirement of faith. I have heard fulfills the requirement of the hearer at one time fulfills the requirement of time and the Buddha is the host. Sravasti is the guardian of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary fulfills the requirements of place. The gathering of great bishops fulfills the audience requirement. Because all six requirements are fulfilled, we know that the sutra can be believed. Thus I have heard. What does thus mean? Thus fills the requirements of faith. You can have faith in drama which is thus, not in drama which is not thus. Thus designates the text as orthodox Buddha drama. Thus means it is thus. Thus is stillness. It is denotes movement. If it is thus, it is. If it is not thus, it is not. Whatever is not non-existent exists. Whatever is without error is correct. Thus means still and unmoving. Thus is true emptiness. It is, is wonderful existence. Wonderful existence is not apart from true emptiness. True emptiness is not apart from wonderful existence. Emptiness and existence are non-dual. Both the empty and existing, neither empty nor existing. This drama can be believed. The four words, thus I have heard, begin all Buddhist sutras. It is thus, if it were not thus, it would not be correct. This is the doctrine, the drama which is thus can be believed. I have heard. Ananda says that he himself personally heard this teaching, but having given proof of the fruit of a hardship, basically Ananda has no ego. How can he say, I have heard, this is the self of no self? Ananda says, I have heard, in order to be comprehensible to ordinary people who have a self, heard feels the accomplishment of the hearer. Why does one have faith? Because one has heard. If one hadn't heard, how could one have faith? The use of thus I have heard comes from instructions given to Ananda by the Buddha just before the Buddha entered Nirvana. One day, Shakyamuni Buddha announced, Tonight, in the middle of the night, I am going to enter Nirvana. When Ananda heard this, he was so distraught that he cried like a baby for his mother and called, Buddha, Buddha, please don't enter Nirvana. Please don't cast it all aside. He cried and pleaded until his brain got adult, probably because he thought that this was what he should be doing. Just then, a blind man came by, one unlike other blind men. 
His ordinary eyes were blind, but his heavenly eye was open. Because he was blind, he was he was he wasn't burdened with a lot of false thinking, and his mind was very clear. Venerable one, he said, addressing Ananda, "Why are you crying? The Buddha is about to enter Nibbana." Ananda replied, "How can I hold back my tears?" The eye. Les Elder replied, "How can you do your work if you cry? After the Buddha enters Nirvana, we will have to establish many things. There is work to be done and questions to be asked. What questions?" said Ananda. "The Buddha is going to Nirvana. What is there left to do? What could be more important than the Buddha's Nirvana?" The blind man. Whose name was Aniruddha, and who was foremost in the capacity of the heavenly eye, said, "There are four extremely important matters which must be settled." "What are they?" asked Ananda. Compiling the sutras is one. He said, "With what was should we begin each sutra?" "True," said Ananda. "That is important. It's a good thing you brought it up." I never would have thought of it myself. All I can think of is the Buddha going to Nirvana. What is the second question I should ask? The venerable Aniruddha said, "We have taken the Buddha as our teacher, but when he goes to Nirvana, who will be our teacher? Should we look for another teacher?" "Right, right," said Ananda. "We should find another good teacher." You're quite right. What is the third? Anuruddha. Anuruddha said, "Now we live in the Buddha, but when he goes to Nirvana, where will we live?" That is very important," said Ananda. "Without a place to live, how can we cultivate the way? Should we find someone, some place else to live? These three matters are extremely important." What is the fourth? Anuruddha said. The Buddha can discipline evil-natured virtues, but after he goes to Nirvana, how shall we take care of them? Now, an evil-natured virtue does nothing but disturb other people. If you meditate, he walks around, clomp clomp, making a loud noise so that no one can enter somebody. When people are walking, they cease to meditate. Look at me, he says. He says. I see much better than all of you, and pretends to have entered samadhi. When people are bowing to the Buddha, the evil-natured Bhikshu likes to recite sutras, and when people are reciting sutras, he likes to bow to the Buddha. In general, he's got to have a special style, the evil-natured Bhikshu style, and he does not follow the rules. If everyone goes one way, he goes the opposite way. He has no consideration for anyone else, but expects everyone to notice him. He's terrific. Everyone says he really cultivates. He insists on being special so that others will notice him and say that he is the best. Fiercely competitive, he must be the strongest, outstanding among the best. He stands like an asura with his hands on his hips, as if to say, "See what a great hero I am." He has to be different and outdo everyone else. When the Buddha was in the world, he could control such evil-natured virtues, and they obeyed his instructions. But after he entered Nibbana, who would supervise them? And who could control the evil-natured laymen who say, "Look at me! I'm more dedicated than all of you other laymen." Actually, it's just because of him and his special style that no one else is dedicated. Aniruddha said, "When the Buddha goes to Nirvana, what are we going to do with the evil-natured bhikkhus and evil-natured laymen?" These are important questions. Said Ananda, "I'll go ask right away." He wiped his eyes, blew his nose, and ran off to the Buddha. 
Buddha, great master, he said, I have four questions which I would like to ask you before you go to Nirvana. World or not one, won't you be compassionate and answer them? All right, said the Buddha. Buddha, said Ananda, you have spoken many sutras. When we compile and edit them, we felt what words should we begin? The Buddha said, all sutras spoken by the Buddhas of the past, present, and future begin with the words, thus I have heard, which means the drama which is thus can be believed. I personally heard it. Ananda said, Secondly, you are our master, but when you enter Nirvana, who will be our teacher? Please instruct us. Should it be Mahakasyapa? The Buddha said, No. When I go to Nirvana, take the Pratimoksa, the precepts, as your teacher. To accord with the Buddha's instructions, those who leave home must first receive the precepts. Then Ananda said, We have always lived with you, Buddha, but when you enter Nirvana, where are we going to live? Shakyamuni Buddha said, When I go to Nirvana, all bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, upasikas who dwell in the four applications of mindfulness, mindfulness with regard to the body, feelings, thoughts, and dharmas. Com- template the body as impure. If you know that the body is impure, you won't love it. And without love, there will be no attachment. Being without attachment is freedom. So first of all, regard the body as impure. Contemplate feelings as suffering. Feelings are all a kind of suffering, whether they are pleasant or unpleasant. For pleasant feelings are the cause of unpleasant feelings. Contemplate thought as impermanent. Thoughts shift and flow and are not permanent. Contemplate dramas as devoid of self. Ananda further asked, How should we treat evil-natured virtues? The Buddha said, That is no problem at all. Simply be silent and they will go away. Find evil people with concentration power. Don't be moved by them. If they are evil, don't be evil in turn. If a mad dog bites you and you bite him back, you're just a dog yourself. Evil-natured people are born with a bad temper. All you can do is ignore them and they will soon lose interest and leave. Oh, said Ananda, it's really very simple. Why did the Buddha tell Ananda to use the four words thus? I have heard these four words have three meanings. To distinguish Buddhist sutras from the writings of other religions. Non-Buddhist religions in India began their text with the words A or O, which means non-existence or existence. As these opposing religions see it, all dharmas in heaven and earth either exist or do not exist. If it is not non-existent, they say, then it exists, and if it doesn't exist, then it's non-existent. In general, as far as they can see, nothing goes beyond existence and non-existence. In the beginning, there wasn't anything, they write. But now there is. None of these religions speaks of true emptiness and wonderful existence. Their doctrines may resemble them somewhat, but they don't explain them in detail. Buddhist sutras are thus. They are just that way. The drama is just that way, you ask. What is not that way? Everything is that way. If you question it and say, what is that way, then nothing is that way. Thus is extremely wonderful. The words, thus I have heard, distinguish Buddhist sutras from the writings of other religions. To resolve the doubts of the assembly, the Buddha knew that everyone should have doubts. After the Buddha's nirvana, while Ananda and Mahakasyapa were editing the sutras, Ananda sat on the Dharma seat to speak the Dharma. Seeing him sitting on the Buddha's seat, 
the members of the assembly sat and gave rise to three doubts. Some thought, Shakyamuni Buddha hasn't completed the stillness. He hasn't gone to Nirvana. Our master lives. They thought Ananda was Shakyamuni Buddha come back to life. Others thought, Shakyamuni Buddha was already entered Nirvana. This must be a Buddha from another direction, north, east, south, or west. No, said others, the great master has gone to Nirvana. He hasn't come back to life, and the Buddhas of the other directions teach people in other directions. They would never come all the way to the Saha world. Why? Ananda himself must have realized Buddhahood. The assembly held these three doubts until Ananda said, Thus I have heard. As soon as this, he said them, everyone knew that Shakyamuni Buddha hadn't come back. They knew it was not a Buddha from another direction, and that Ananda had not become a Buddha. The drama which is thus is that which Ananda personally heard from Shakyamuni Buddha. Three doubts suddenly arose and four was reserved them. To end the assembly's debates of all the great bishops, Ananda was the youngest. He was born on the day Shakyamuni Buddha realized, realized Buddhahood, and when the Buddha went to Nirvana, Ananda was only 49 years old. Why was Ananda selected to explain and edit the sutras? Old Kasyapa was the eldest and Maudhyayana and Shariputra were both of higher status than Ananda. There were many others in the assembly with more way virtual and learning than him. He was the youngest and it was likely that no one would believe in him and that many would try to be first. One might say, I've heard more sutras than you, so I should explain them. But when Ananda said, Thus I have heard, Everyone knew that these were not Ananda's principles or the principles of the Great Assembly. This is the drama which I, Ananda, personally heard the Buddha speak. It is not your teaching and not my teaching. It is our master teaching. You are not first and I am not first. This silenced the Assembly's debates.